Are we entitled this towards the IRP Charter 2.0? Because this is hopefully less in a formal, boring business meeting than something to talk about a very concrete output, which is the Charter of Human Rights and Principles. I brought 100 copies. I have 100 more copies back, back in the my luggage only allowed me to bring that many, but they've gone like hotcakes, and uh, there are two copies left, um, but there are more <laughs> on the sheet if you wish to be sent a copy. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it postage-wise, but I do have more, and there will be, I think, a second print run by the look of it. So I do only have two here. Really? Okay. <laughs> can you just leave it standing there for the meantime so people can see? <laughs> There are a couple more plugs I'm going to make as well, but um, in due course. I have some apologies. Eduardo Bertoni cannot make it. Uh, Raika Jorgensen, uh, it is one o'clock in the morning in Denmark, and she has given her apologies, but she will look forward to the update. And Jack SMK um, may not make it. She's not a morning person, and I think she has also another appointment. And Jeremy Malcolm is hopefully on his way. So I'm just mentioning those names because they emailed me, which was really nice of them. <laughs> so actually today I think there's some people in the room who may not be quite aware of where, how we got to this point. I'm not going to tell you everything because in the booklet it's a terrible habit of academics to say go read the book. But in this case I have to because of time. But in a very brief unacademic introduction you'll find out where we came from to get here. Um, and here was already public in 2011. What we have done is actually put this all in one book, which has proved extremely successful. We crowdsourced the booklet, um, and we are nearly there. We have less than 150 American dollars to to um, to catch. I've got some cash in my purse. If you want to give me cash, I'm going to make a payment on behalf of about six people already. So if you want to give me five dollars, ten dollars, please. Um, which is quite exciting. We raised about eleven hundred, twelve hundred American dollars to fund the design, which is a professional design that is now available to us to use. And of course the printing and all the overheads that are involved. Uh, this book has not only been snapped up, I'm talking about the booklet form at the moment because it's our big output, <laughs> but also translations are also underway. We have a Finnish translation already underway. We have a Spanish translation already underway. We have a Arabic translation um, almost, almost underway because it has just been promised. And we have a, hopefully a Portuguese version and so on and so forth. The point about the translations is this charter booklet puts together two key documents from the coalition. Uh, the coalition is what the IGF calls a dynamic coalition. It is very much an animal, if I may use that term, of the IGF. And this charter was actually collabo-written. Collabo-written. And this is true. I've been following this process since it began in 2008. And it was a, a, a small modest but actually turning out to be quite a major success of the idea that people from different stakeholder groups can actually work together as individuals and as, as, as representatives of their organisations. And that process in itself is an interesting story. The outcome was that an expert group finally got together to draft this beautifully written document. Uh, and that's the translations we're working on now because the main document, the main charter, which is modelled on Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other major UN covenants, such as the rights of children, the rights of people with disability, um, we needed people with legal expertise and human rights knowledge to write, help us draft the final document. Those of us in the first draft showed our ignorance rather than our skills. So <laughs> they knocked it into shape. And we have this lovely 22 or 21 lock, uh, section document. The smaller document, which has been used for outreach, education, I use it in class for different levels of students. I know people have used it for other things. Is what we call the 10 punchy principles. And that's in the beginning of the booklet. The 10 punchy principles are already translated into 22 languages. Already 22 languages. So if there are any languages not covered, We've just had the Arabic one spruced up. Apparently there was some funny thing happened to it. Um, please let us know. They're much shorter. They're very short. So they're easier to translate. So this larger translation exercise is very exciting. It has emerged when people see that this is a concrete outcome. We're 
talk about the content today, of course. <laughs> so we've also had in two workshops, we co uh, convened two workshops. Workshop 99 was the first one with the uh, Association of Progressive Communications, which everybody knows as APC. APC, <laughs> not ABC. Um, and that was extremely well. That was called Charting the Charter, and that was concentrating on this document and its relationship to important other uh, rights, charters, manifestos. And then we got some very concrete suggestions from government officials. We got a very critical reading from our Microsoft representative. He discovered two typos. I had only discovered one, so he discovered the other one. And he had some points to make, which I think are worth hearing. So it was an extremely productive workshop. Our second workshop, I believe, was 276. I haven't got that number wrong. Which was uh, rights for disadvantaged groups. And that was an extremely helpful workshop because Section 8, is it? Section 8, I'm going to forget. What we have a section devoted to rights for disability groups, building on the Convention of Rights for Persons with Disability, is that right? Um, which is also a major UN outcome. And we've had some clear suggestions on it. So you can see already that the Charter gives people something to hang on to, something to look at, something to respond to. We all like responding to concrete stuff. And that's what this project has been. Strangely enough, the assumption that if it stayed digital, it would be more effective has proved erroneous. Even students like the look of the book. So there we go. Listen to the um, Now, the concrete outcomes, which is what we concentrate on today, we've had, of course, a very close relationship with the special rapporteur on freedom of expression, Frank LaRue, from the beginning. Uh, the, this version 1.1 that is now in the booklet was in fact presented to Frank LaRue in Stockholm in 2011. And at that point, all of us know, he was writing his report, his landmark report that human rights, particularly freedom of expression, also exist in the online sphere. And we also know that in 2012, the UN Human Rights Council endorsed this premise. And this is extremely important for us to have this kind of synergy with such an important body. And frankly, we in person was there. Um, okay. My predecessor, Lisa Horner, and Dixie Walton were working with Frank Leroux at that time. So we can take pride as a coalition from the IGF that we were there at the beginning with this important UN step to recognize existing rights. Our second um, close working relationship has been with the Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe took a look at the charter work, got very involved, and noted that, of course, there are already many existing rights out there, particularly in the European uh, situation, that nobody knows about. And once this charter started to frame this very broad category of human rights as something specific for the online environment and started to show that we're not, we, we may be hacking the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but we're not throwing it out. We're adapting it and translating it for specific online scenarios, some of which are unfolding before our very eyes. The Council of Europe decided this is a time to flesh out the, uh, the charter, which is very broad, and generate a guide. They called it then a compendium, but that word has been dropped. It is now a guide on rights for internet users, and it has been released tomorrow. So I'd like to advertise, because they're a very, very close relationship with us as well. The guide has been released tomorrow at 11 o'clock, I believe. 11 o'clock. I have one version here. Please let me keep that, because that's my hard copy. But I have some flyers here. Okay? So this is very exciting, because the expert group that drafted the charter are part of the ex -group, expert group. They helped draft the guide in the Council of Europe. So UNHCR, Council of Europe. And my exciting announcement today for the transcript and all those I hope you will follow. Last night, the HIVOS Internet Governance Project for the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, said they are going to be actively and publicly endorsing the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet in a region where we know, of course, this is uncharted territory, perhaps, for some governments. So to have them endorse this, to take the charter on, and they are behind the Arabic translation. So we're getting on with that. I think this is extremely exciting. So Hanan Bujani, who could not be here today, has made that clear. And that is something I think we can work together on.
So, my last point is we still have our fundraiser open on the last year. <laughs> so, if you go to www.internetrightsandprinciples.com and just scroll down, you'll see the charter PDF document, um, and click on our fundraiser. We really are so, so close. So, five dollars, it's fine. Or give me cash. I won't run away to a warm climate. I'm already there. <laughs> Dot, 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 excuse me, dot org. Ah! <laughs> Just shows you how hard the default position is to get rid of. Dot org. Thank you very much. No, dot org. So just scroll down a little bit. Okay. So next to the end today, five minutes, because I want to give the mic to Stuart if he's ready. <laughs> so he has to go. Is This is a sort of open mic session. It's not going to be a panel. Uh, there are two points. We've had a lot of feedback on the content the, the really nitty-gritty of the charter. We'd like to just, in the first part of today, have a little round of people who have read the charter or have started to notice it, how they think it can help, and particularly how it is already helping in their work, whether it is in this particular ministry, whether it is on the ground with an NGO, or whether they're going to take it back to their schools. It's turning out to be an extremely important educational tool. I was lecturing by five-minute um, dropping a spot on a lecture international Relations students in Wales, which is in England, not so well, the UK, so not in the United Kingdom. Um, so any of those, I'd like to pass the microphone to the room. I have my rapporteur Robert here, and I'm not sure how many notes I can take. So who'd like to go first? We're going to do that first feedback on the chart of the project itself, and then we'll move to next steps, ideas about what to do next. I've already got a long list. People have been coming to me with fabulous ideas. We're going to keep it open. We're not going to judge any of the suggestions and say, no, that won't work. No, we don't like it. We just want to hear what you have to say. And then we move slightly to a little bit of businessy stuff. We might even be finished by 10 o'clock. Let's see how the room is. So who wants to go first, if anybody? Oh, yes, of course, for the record, please identify yourself. Thank you. So I'm Stuart Hamilton from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA, uh, and I'm here in my capacity as uh, one of the conveners of the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access through Libraries, and we were very, uh, very happy yesterday to um, co-facilitate and moderate the workshop 276 on access for disadvantaged groups, which, as Marianne said, went very well, I felt, and I can see panelists uh, in the room. Um, so I don't have very long comments, just that our Dynamic Coalition is uh, fully supportive of the Charter. Uh, IFLA itself developed um, a document called the Internet Manifesto in 2002, which has been a, a guiding document for the library profession over the last decade. But as you can imagine, um, a document written about Internet principles in 2002 uh, now seems rather dated. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we will be updating that during 2014 uh, and the Charter is going to prove a very useful document to help us do that. So I'll be happy to feed back to the group over the course of the next year as to how that's going. And meanwhile, uh, we have already begun to promote the Charter within the library community and I'm sure there'll be uh, plenty of discussion on it. So just short remarks uh, to let you know that the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access in Libraries is fully supportive of all the work going on here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. So we look forward to getting particularly the concrete feedback as this charter goes to organisations. It's extremely important. So thank you very much. Stuart now has to leave us, so thanks. <laughs> Who's next? Particularly just ideas, if nothing else. Dixie? Eating a breakfast? <laughs> did you bring your coffee? Oh, you did too. Oh, clever. Hello, my name is Dixie Hilton. I work for Global Partners Digital in the UK and I've been an active participant in the IRP since I joined this field about four years ago. Um, one of the ways that the IRP Charter is being used at the moment is that the Council of Europe, who were very active actually, they were on the steering committee as well of the IRP during the time when the last version and the one before that, I think, were um, being put together. And um, one of the ways that it's being taken forward is that the Council of Europe has put together a working group 
um, to make a guide for that's directed at internet users um, to explain to them in a kind of simple way what their rights mean online and what kind of remedies might be available. Um, and that's something that came very, very much out of the IRP charter work. In fact, on the working group, because it's Council of Europe, there are seven governmental representatives and then there are six independent experts and among those six, three of them were human rights experts that worked on our charter. One of them was a co-chair um, and one of the government Actually, two of the government representatives had also been involved in the charter as well. So the, the two initiatives are really, really linked. And that's one of the, um, when we were putting the charter together, one of the big discussions we often had was whether this was something that we wanted to look at enforcement somehow, or was it more of a kind of, um, a, a kind of debate aid, um, trying to push understandings forward. And I think the charter, as it is there, is more of a debate aid, but there are ways that you can take that and try and move more towards enforcement, and that's what's happening at the Council of Europe at the moment. I'd like to pass on to Ma'am. And just to say that the Council of Europe is having an open forum about that guide tomorrow, so if you want to feed into that, it's still in draft form. I'm Mike Godwin. Uh, I'm with Internews. Uh, we do uh, uh, public policy development with different. One of the th things I, I, I want to note at the outset is that, uh, in, in my experience in this uh, in this field of, uh, of international uh, cyber law, one of the ironies is that ha has been that. Uh, many uh, nations around the world have adopted uh, cybercrime statutes in order to comply uh, as signatories to the Budapest Convention, the Council of Europe Cybercrime Treaty, uh, often uh, imp passing implementing legislation that I think most people in open societies would regard as repressive and undermining uh, uh, human rights. So I think it's uh, very helpful that the Council of Europe is now playing a, a more positive influence. I don't think that this was an intention. Uh, uh, this was the intention of the Council of Europe to lead to uh, repressive legislation in signatory countries, but the fact is it, 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 has, it has done so. Uh, my own work uh, with Internews and with our partners has led me to believe that uh, positive rights statements, that framing of uh, human rights in positive affirmative contexts as a framework for all cyber uh, law related uh, initiatives uh, is often a very productive strategy even in countries that have either no tradition of internet law uh, public policy advocacy or in countries that for whatever reason have found themselves stalled or paralyzed in their, in their work in progressing uh, individual rights. Uh, and uh, so, I, so I'm actually working on a paper which may eventually be published uh, that will discuss uh, how uh, rights instruments uh, can be used uh, to get, to, to essentially restart human rights dialogues within uh, countries. And I think that what, uh, uh, a, an optimum outcome may be will be for uh, 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 charters like this one uh, and for positive framings, affirmative framings of protection of uh, individual uh, human rights, including, of course, freedom of expression and privacy, will lead ultimately to uh, uh, implementing uh, human rights instruments within uh, national law frameworks which may in fact be uh, customized or uh, bespoke for particular countries and cultures, but nevertheless will uh, frame uh, uh, dialogue positively, uh, policy positively going forward. Uh, 
so I hope that that is uh, one of the aims of this, and I and I look forward to uh, seeing how the this document uh, can be used uh, to promote constructive dialogue within nations as that as our partners and other NGOs are working on a national level. Yeah, thank you very much. I think the stress on the positive framework and hopefully having good law made, not bad law, because that's of course. So Maureen next and then following. First Maureen, because she's in the queue. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm Maureen Manzuki. I'm an academic based in Paris, but also I have an activist hat uh, as a member of the European Digital Rights uh, Association. Um, I wanted to, um, to give more details about the, the process uh, uh, in writing the guide, but first I will uh, take on uh, what uh, Mike just said, uh, because um, uh, we, know the, we know this issue of the Cybercrime Convention and how uh, the Council of Europe, another um, division, I would say, of the Council of Europe, because these intergovernmental organizations have uh, their own lives too. Uh, so another division has been promoting, and that's through the Cybercrime Convention, the Budapest Convention, and I would like to mention it to insist that all these workshops in Asia, in South America, in Africa, have been uh, organized thanks to a huge amount of money given by Microsoft, uh, uh, especially my Microsoft, to organize this uh, workshop. So we have this, but we shouldn't forget another positive instrument of the, positive from our point of view, instrument of the Council of Europe, which is also a convention, like the Cybercrime Convention, and this is the Convention on the uh, Protection of Personal Data, or Convention 108 of the Council of Europe. And we very much hope that the Council of Europe will decide to promote the 108 Convention as much as it uh, promotes the Cybercrime uh, Convention. And uh, good morning, Lee, but the Council of Europe representative, the positive side, I would say, of the Council of Europe. Um, on the process uh, to uh, draft uh, this guide, first of all, I, I would like to mention that the guide is uh, the guide itself is an annex of a recommendation to member states. And although a recommendation of the Council of Europe is a soft law instrument, it is non-binding. This is a very important. It's le the level right under the convention, the treaty. And uh, it is important to the extent that the European Court of Human Rights is now quoting, uh, referencing recommendations of the Council of Europe in its uh, judgment. So uh, what was important in this process is, first of all, that uh, civil society uh, member and representatives of the IRP coalitions, uh, including myself, were uh, part of this process, not simply as observer, but as true members of the group at the same level as some governments. Uh, represented there. And then uh, maybe we will get back to this a uh, bit later in the discussion uh, on the content of the, uh, the guide itself. With respect to the content of the charter, we <coughs> have had some discussions and some decisions to make together in this group, especially on uh, what is called in the charter uh, the right to access the internet. Uh, I think it's interesting if we have time later in this meeting to discuss whether or not uh, we have uh, approved this uh, notion of a new right to, uh, to, to access and, and for which uh, reasons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. We'll return to those, those uh, uh, substantive points hopefully shortly. And we have Yvonne yeah. and then someone's hand up there. Okay, so first of all, So I want to ask a clarification question. My name is uh, Shahla Rashid. I work on internet policy in India. Um, so at one place, uh, the report, I, I was just skimming through it, it says that uh, uh, since this charter is based on human rights principles, so it will be binding upon states. So I want to clarify whether th this will be binding in the same way as ICCPR is binding, for example. Uh, it remains to be seen. 
What that's not intended at the moment. This is we are on a long, long road. This chart is a framing document. Well, some people have there are great ambitions, but uh, the title of this workshop is Towards Charter 2.0. But it, it speaks in that language as far as we're concerned right now. But there are many points in which uh, to be binding, a lot of more discussion has to take place. It but it's within that tradition. Adopted by the States. Adoption. Um, that's something about next steps. Mm -hmm. what, what would your views on that? Whether it should be adopted a charter like this? Um, no, at some at uh, at another point it says that it does not include all rights, but that doesn't mean that those rights don't exist. Um, so obviously, there will, I imagine that there will be more discussion. Uh, it's very carefully worded that this is. Um, I'm not a lawyer here, so perhaps the expert group can help me out there. <laughs> um, it's very carefully worded uh, during the drafting. I certainly remember you to be very careful that you didn't write in such a way that the spirit of the document could be turned to purposes of repression. So it's not trying to say some rights and not other rights. It's written within that uh, UN legal framework. So I don't quite know what you're referring to exactly. Perhaps you could um, elaborate. Yeah, I'm not sure what Good morning. Um, my name is Beryl Aidy. I'm from the Kenya Human Rights Commission. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for uh, this information. I, I find it um, quite useful um, as we're going to be having some uh, workshops with uh, the wider NGO um, or human rights or civil society in the, uh, who are members of the mainstream civil society but are n not involved in internet governance um, uh, discourse or internet rights discourse. So I, I think it's quite uh, straightforward and quite clear and easy to understand. I also want to appreciate um, uh, the, 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 the articles themselves, um, I think number 20, duties and responsibilities of the internet. This is something that has been taken for granted, at least where I come from. Uh, people think that they can just say anything on the internet because of the free, uh, freedom of expression uh, and, and um, without really realizing that um, there are duties and responsibilities. And so I, I appreciate the fact that uh, it recognizes that and uh, divides that in, into two, um, respect for others and then also responsibility for the power holders, which I think uh, sort of like safe, safeguards against um, uh, it being used or, or rather um, other laws that, have, uh, that could be enacted that could be repressive or could um, um, violate human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. I think that kind of responds to the point we're at very well. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, sorry, of course, anybody else. I had you in the queue. Excuse me. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Jan Norman, and I work with the APC Women's Rights Program. Um, and the first thing really is to appreciate the, the growth and movement, I think, of the Internet rights with the principles and charter. I think what we really want to contribute to this discussion is a recognition of the fact that equal application and understanding doesn't always result in equal experiences and consequences, um, including and in fact especially in the context of human rights. Um, so we're really looking at the gender dimensions and beginning to understand how the recommendations will affect different groups of people unequally. And I think that's the basis for a really interesting discussion that can move us into a, into a space where we are considering that people are not homogenous, that responses are not homogenous, and so the kinds of recommendations we are calling for need to consider this. One of the things we especially are concerned about is how recommendations could result for one group of people, but not for others. Um, in the work that we're doing, we often find when we're talking about violence online, sexuality, the response by governments is to say, oh, so you need protection. And in the language of protection, what we also know is that it closes down spaces. It doesn't open them up. And so that's what we want to contribute. I point Julie Taken, thank you very much, thank you very much. Of course, this links to the Gender IT workshop where a number of the issues around the Charter's clauses with respect to women's participation and 
we've also brought up some of the mental note of those things as well. Um, just final comments on this particular part of the session. We're going to move to next steps. Um, anybody else have any specific concrete? Uh, oh, yes, sorry. Yes, go ahead. And Robert. Okay, hello. Yeah, so I'm Mika. I'm from the Foundation for Media Alternatives in the Philippines and also um, a strong community member of the Philippine Internet Freedom Alliance. Um, we, have, we have this cyber crime law that was passed, that was passed um, into, uh, last year. And when we were talking about uh, the, the, um, our, our petition against the law, we use actually the Internet Rights and Principles um, document so that we can forward our, our, um, our arguments against the law. So I um, really appreciate what is happening here. And um, right now we're trying to, uh, actually, um, as you all know, we have this Magna Carta for Philippine Internet Freedom. Um, and they also used um, the IRP document um, as reference when they were drafting the, the, the bill. And we were really optimistic that the legislators in the Philippines will really look into this document as well so that we can have um, a good legislation on governing our internet. So there, so um, yeah. Thank you very much. I'll come. Um, yeah, and another, another thing, because I was in the, in the discussion yesterday, the main session discussion on cybercrime, and I was really disappointed that they, they're not really talking about, um, you know, rights there. Um, it's just about um, technical uh, problems uh, online and no recognition of, of the things that we're doing here in Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. So I think um, it, it's also good that, you know, um, uh, intervene in that types of discussion. I don't know who you're saying. Yes, given cyber, cyber security and cyber crime are the hot topics, your points well taken. Being more proactive and intervening in discussions where rights are not considered relevant or not technical enough. That's part of the work to bring these very high level ideas and principles and rights into the sort of really everyday nitty gritty of how the internet's worked. Um, design, but also how people use it. So this is uh, the broad terrain which we're working. Now, well, someone else's hand is up. Who was it? Oh, Robert, of course. I'm sorry. Hi, thank you. Uh, Robert Bowen, uh, a member of the Internet Rights and Principles Dynamic Coalition and a college professor uh, in Ohio. Um, I find the use of this document uh, of the charter very helpful in uh, a class that I teach, Human Rights in the Digital Age, and I use um, texts such as Human Rights in the Global Information Society by Ricky Jorgensen. Uh, but this, this document actually is, uh, allows um, me to shape lesson plans that um, can encourage a collection of case studies uh, around identifying particular rights that are violated and how particular principles can address those rights. It's very helpful as um, an educational resource. Thank you. Okay. One more comment if there is one before we move to next steps. If any we're sort of moving in that direction. Okay. Anybody else? is it somebody online? Oh no, it's too early in the morning for some too late at night for others. Understood. Too early in the morning for me. Um Right, let's move to next steps. Now we've had a lot of discussions, we're getting a lot of questions about what our next steps are. <laughs> um, we are a dynamic coalition, we are excited to see initiatives like the Council of Europe's Guide where it anchors the Charter in real life um, um, legislative practice. Uh, we have a complimentary document, so we're excited that we can go there tomorrow at the launch. It's exciting to hear about it's been, how it's been used in class. I think these, to me, these strike me as next steps that we've already started. But um, this is a coalition that is within the IGF. We've made it clear already today in the last few days that the Charter has gone beyond the IGF. We're not locked into it. The IGF is simply a place people come 
and sometimes impact is not immediately evident. But nevertheless, we need to have discussion about next steps in terms of, and here let's not worry about whether it's possible or not right now. You know, the first thing you do when you think about next steps, think, oh, I haven't got the money, I haven't got the time, I haven't got the, I haven't got the people, I haven't got the bravado, I haven't got the skills, or we haven't got the skills. Can we just brainstorm? Then I'll write this all up with Robert's help so we can sort of issue a bullet point to the larger list. Um, how is the list, that piece of paper going around with names, people writing their names? How well is it? Okay, keep it going. Okay, any suggestions, ideas? Please, the sky at the moment is the limit in this room. We're not going to say, yes, we're going to do this all. We're not going to say, we're not going to shoot you down in flames with, no, we cannot. And do the Obama thing, well, yes, we can. <laughs> if. <laughs> okay, please. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Easton, I'm um, a legal academic in the UK, and I mean, first I'd like to congratulate you on this document. Um, it's, it's fundamental to how the internet develops, keeping, as was mentioned, a positive focus on rights. Um, what I would like to talk about, as far as future steps are concerned, um, are some potentially legalistic moves that you, that you could take, and I apologise for coming from quite a strong legal background here. But it's been mentioned that this has been adopted as far in terms of a recommendation at, at an EU level. And again, I apologise for talking about this at a specifically EU level. But what I was wondering was whether or not there's um, a case for working with member state governments in order to see this charter attached as either an amendment or a schedule to relevant domestic legislation. And in this way, it can become more pervasive and have an, an impact more at, at a kind of at a, a more local level. And unless there are certain regulations coming from the EU, there's no need for the actual member states to, to to move on this. And I've seen this in relation to standards on accessibility, where they have been mentioned as schedules to domestic legislation in the UK, and this has given them much more of a kind of robust, tangible um, impact um, on development of policy and development of law. So I was just wondering whether perhaps with the Council of Europe, there is a need to talk about this at a higher level and get the member states to embed this, perhaps not as direct primary legislation, but as a document that is referenced at the end of legislative uh, provisions that are made. Okay, thanks Catherine for noting that. That's uh, very down to earth. This is what we're looking for. Thank you. No apologies needed to go the legalistic route. Any other suggestions? Yes, Carmen? Oh. Yeah. Uh, okay. We're taking ideas at the moment. We can comment on whether they're useful or, or possible later. So, Carmen, yeah? Hey, uh, I'm Carmen Turk, and I actually have, um, uh, it's really a suggestion, it's kind of like um, uh, sharing an experience in, in Estonia. Uh, during the ACTA protests, um, well, they were all over Europe, so I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, in Estonia, they were extremely uh, big in the meaning that it, it was the uh, biggest protest in uh, Estonian history since 91 when the independence was regained. Uh, so during and after ACTA, uh, the government, uh, the, well, the civil society tried to kind of uh, draft something for the government in order for it to, in the future, when enacting laws in the field of internet would not go viral again as it did when enacting ACTA or trying to enact an ACTA. Uh, so uh, in that process, actually, civil society tried to uh, do their own Estonian kind of principles for internet regulation and uh, the IOP principles, rights and principles were referenced by me as a basis for it. So it, it was already a basis for um, uh, draft law. So it, it's just an experience of how to use it in the legislative process. 
Thanks, Karen. That's very useful to me. These examples are very useful. Now, I think Miriam is next, and there's somebody else. And then the, uh, over here. Oh, you have it. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to, to clarify that uh, it, uh, we are talking about the Council of Europe, not the Council of the European Union. So it's uh, even better. I mean, it's a larger 47 uh, steps. And uh, uh, about this issue of using this uh, charter uh, either to to have uh, better national legislation or as a real tool for civil society at na at national level. Uh, I think what we could do, what is possible to do with this charter is taking, I mean, right by right as it is uh, uh, defined, and we can use it first to uh, uh, develop some indicators on the uh, level of, uh, of um, uh, on, on, on whether national legislation are compliant with human rights or, or not. And uh, also we could use this article, for instance, I'm thinking of uh, the number four, uh, right to development through the, the Internet, which probably still needs a lot of work. Uh, uh, yet we can use it uh, to um, assess telecom regulation uh, because it has to do with telecom regulation at national and at international uh, uh, level. It has to do with network neutrality. So we can use this uh, charter and each article o o of it to uh, assess uh, this legislation and, of course, help uh, developing better national uh, legislation. Yes, exactly. 21 or 22, I forget, clauses are each in themselves the beginning of the tip of various icebergs. So they, of course, apart from addressing some of the uh, need perhaps for the writing, that's another step, to at least use what we have currently as a focus, as a hub. Is that what you mean, like focus on particular sections? I think that's a very good idea too. They're all good ideas so far. Anybody else? With Lee, Papa Lee, you go for it. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Lee Hibbard from the Council of Europe. Um, I think a very good step would be to, and I'm thinking about the, char the, the charter, but also about the guide that you mentioned. Um, I think it's really important to uh, try to measure what comes next. It's very difficult. It's okay drafting and, and, and doing things and talking and, and having documents, but the, the, the very difficult thing in, in many fields is to try to measure uh, the impact in different countries across the world. Was it used? Was it referred to in Estonia? Because referrals to different documents get lost in the process of, you know, a lot of documents I come across and people appropriate them and then don't refer back to them. So that makes it very difficult to understand whether it was a real source of relevance or a reference and it was useful. So if the, if the coalition can, can come together and say, in Estonia, you know, it was used. In this country, it was useful. In this country, it was done like this. That will help to catalogue and to sh actually demonstrate how, you know, useful these documents are. Not because it's a document, but because it changes the law, or because it creates a movement, or it cl clarifies a right, which is unclear. And even if it just means that there was a discussion which clarified something in a right in a country far away, uh, that's very useful. That's very important. I mean, that, uh, it's very difficult to explain to policymakers. Um, the utility of something if you don't have sometimes proof that this is happening. But they don't always refer back. So that's a very, uh, a ne a next steps, even to do with the work of the Council of Europe, I think it's very useful. Um, Marion, can I talk about the guide or have you mentioned it? I came in late. We mentioned it on several occasions, but uh, just to, do you want to say, I've talked about the, open, the launch tomorrow at 11, and perhaps you could tell us what you're looking for from uh, us. Can I think you said it all. You said that it, it, these two processes are, are complementary. Um, I think you really need you really need to be there if you can really tomorrow because it's not about uh, it's not just an event with the word Europe in the title because it's the Council of Europe. For unfortunately, there's too few words. I, I want to forget the word Europe because I really I sincerely think that this is not about anything particular country or region. It's about people. It's about people's rights, and whether those rights are a little bit different over there or, or slightly modified over there, it doesn't matter. 
Um, the IGF has been about bringing people together and discussing and um, coming together on things which they believe in. They believe in the internet, they believe in the openness of the internet, they believe in a free internet, uh, and of course we believe in people's rights on the internet. And that's been a major uh, priority for the whole, since the IGF began, and in the World Summit process before, about people having the ability to have rights and freedoms. And they sometimes get, let's say, lost in the politics of internet, the control and the governance of the internet, which goes very far away from people. And, um, but it's a constant feature, a massive feature on the agendas. It's always, uh, most of the events, let's say three quarters, always have a human rights dimension to them. So that is the, that for me that's the crux of it. And I, I really hope that um, you can all be there because um, if we can get this guide for you off the ground, if you can comment and input, and if, you, if we can measure it, um, we can really push back in terms of internet governance. If we can create a reference point, you know, regional or global, you know, whichever title, it's going to be very useful to try to get... If, if there's a, now there's a discussion about internet governance principles. Oh, I have to hurry. Uh, if, for example, in the ne ne next month we can have internet governance principles which are generally agreed across the world, it's a great, it's a great source of reference. If we can do the same thing with the rights, or what they mean in practice, that's a fantastic step. So, you know, that's where I think we should go, you know, having, you know, creating clarity on these rights in practice. And that's where the guide goes. So I hope we can contribute tomorrow. Okay, thanks. I think that's a very important invitation to us all. Um, anybody else in terms of next steps? Uh, as the uh, Charter of Human Rights and Principles, just to recall, this is a delicate uh, distinction, but an, an important overlap. Um, not all principles are human rights. And one can argue that human rights are always a principle, but how and in what form is the question. So there are actually um, discussions at the moment about exactly coming down to some uh, large global agreement which brings us up to recognition and uh, applicability. But we're at the moment just carrying on with uh, what are the next steps in terms of the charter. More promotion, more outreach measuring, joining the dots, really not just settling for it got reference in a book list somewhere. I think these points are very important. References for academics are important, but for policy makers, mm, mm, we shouldn't overrate ourselves. Okay? So it's not just about being in a reference list. However, if you're not in a reference list, you're nowhere. So I think this point is we have to do more than just say we got reference. Any other comments about what to do next? Someone? No? Um, there's a piece of paper still going around for those of you who just came into the room if you wish to make your name and email address or just sort of know where you're from and, and who you are. But, okay, go. Okay, I, um, I don't know a lot about the process and how it all came. This, this is my, also my first time at the IGF. Um, but I was wondering how much is the UN, oh my God, how much is the UN uh, involved in the process? Not that I have any special uh, preference for the UN. But in my understanding, that's how all the instruments that, you know, that get recognized or that are binding on states or are recognized. The UN is involved in the sense that, as I said in the beginning, how Frank Lowe, the special rapporteur, I was uh, uh, very instrumental in moving the charter forward in its first version. This version was uh, presented to him. When the Charter version 1.1, which is what this booklet is, was released, and it's through that synergy that we had Frank Lowe's report on freedom of expression online, and there's a direct link between that report, of course, and the UN Human Rights Council's recognition that human rights online exists. So there is definitely a, uh, a connection. But I think those sorts of questions we can happily answer. Um, but thank you. Yes, I think it's something we need to. It's a good point, though. The UN is it is embedded in the UN. Our legal instruments, but it also relates to very important moves at the UN level to recognise human rights online. But recognition is the first step. Lots to go. Yeah. Um, anybody else? I think we need to move on. Okay, yes, Shona. Some at the back. Just bear with us. I think we can, uh, because I'd like to move to just the sort of practical business shortly, but I want to make sure everyone's had a chance. Of course, we're open to suggestions at any point. The energy is not over yet. If you have a brilliant idea, please um, let us know. Go for it. Thank you. Um, so 
this is sort of building on um, the previous question relating to um, building on human rights mechanisms. So I'm wondering, um, Marianne or anyone else in the room, how you see uh, the Internet Rights and Principles Charter um, input into discussions, for example, on hate speech or racism in the Internet and discussions about responses to that. So, um, so some of the discussions that have been had so far are the need for more access to the Internet by marginalized groups, which I know is part of um, the principles. But are there other ways you see the Charter sort of inputting to those sorts of discussions? Dixie, ma'am? I think there's a lot of work being done, the Internet Democracy Project, Dixie herself, and Anya, you, you wrote a specific paper on hate speech. Am I right? Was it hate speech or state surveillance? I'm oh, sorry. Um, yes, I think that's the work that needs to be done. I think the charter needs to be, for me, brought into those intervened as a part of the intervention of conversations. But I think if you read the charter closely, there are plenty of places where you can see that um, civil society activists trying to stop the idea that freedom of expression means you can be rude to everybody everywhere at any time. Um, but this, of course, is the difference between the First Amendment in the US, where you can be rude to anybody at any time, uh, up to a point, so Americans can correct them on that, but that's the usual kind of decision you get. And the rest of the, uh, the European setting, uh, perhaps that has to be regulated. But Yes, I think the charter can be used. So how do you think the charter can be used in that sense, specifically in your, in your point? Um, well, I think it's interesting. I think there are, I mean, as you say, there's rights that are incorporated into the charter, and so there are, of course, freedom of expression, but there are also um, other freedoms related to, um, you know, freedom from discrimination, um, the right to life, liberty, and security. And so um, I'm just sort of wondering whether or not you see there's a space for expansion or whether you see um, any of the rights and principles within the Charter um, being developed in some way to specifically respond to these sorts of quite complex discussions. I will take that as a very helpful suggestion that indeed that's what we can do. I think Mary mentioned that each section be unpacked and made applicable to different situations, case studies. So you have the section as it is, and then you flesh it out, not try and do everything all at once. Yeah? So in fact that each section can be a sort of template in itself and feedback and then do a sort of loop. But absolutely, I think it's a very good suggestion. I, I certainly support it personally. I hope we can as a coalition. Uh, and we have someone else here? Oh, I, I was just going to say in, in defense of our First Amendment in the United <laughs> States, <laughs> No, I was just thinking about... Uh, about please, I think, sorry to stop oh, you. Please, please, I think, sorry. Uh, my name is Susan Anthony. I work for the federal government in Alexandria, Virginia, in the United States. Um, I was just thinking about something uh, as we're talking about this that, that bothers me deeply, and I was trying to figure out exactly where this would fit in. I think uh, it, it probably would be a prohibited conduct uh, certainly under, a under these declarations and uh, possibly under uh, <coughs> right of free speech in the United States, it was certainly rude. So what am I talking about? Uh, for those of you who uh, follow such issues, uh, you may well know that the Redskins sports team name, um, uh, the Redskins being the football team for Washington, D.C., is very much in the news. It has been off and on for some years, but it is incredibly hot, hot, hot right now. So uh, it's very interesting. Every time the Washington Post uh, has an article um, online, uh, makes, it art makes one of its articles accessible online, there is, of course, an opportunity to comment. And there has been a great uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth with many people saying that the Redskins' name does not offend them. Of course, they're, they're not native, but at any rate, one person wrote something that so offended me and continues to bother me. He said, I have no objection, and I am from a tribe. And I thought, now that is something we need to know. He said, I am from the tribe Slapaho. And I thought, well, I, I think we need to get that taken down. And I, I think that this would, in fact, uh, violate the, the freedom of expression because it is uh, an expression that offends and is disturbing. But we have a long ways to go in terms of educating people as to these lines between 
free expression and just damn rude and offensive. Yes, this is always a very delicate issue for, I think, for regulators at a very local level, particularly as online circulation um, expands and all these these issues, these take down policies. Uh, can we, uh, was it Mike? Am I correct? Yeah, thank you very much. A case study perhaps for future reference. Yeah. Is the mic on? Okay, very good. So, uh, speaking as a First Amendment lawyer, um, what I what I try to take a historical view of uh, of rights instruments, not just the First Amendment, but I look I, I, and certainly in my current work, I look very hard at uh, human rights instruments in different countries around the world and in the international human rights instruments and. Uh, I think, it, I think it helps to take a historical view because prior to what happened, uh, not just in the United States with freedom of expression under the First Amendment, but with freedom of expression issues in many uh, developed countries in the 20th century, and it almost all happened in the 20th century, uh, we, we came to realize, those of us who work in this space, that prior to that period of very, very rapid development, for almost all of human history, every government everywhere reserved to itself the right to shut people up. And uh, it, it was just understood that governments have the right to do that. And uh, for all that one may find, uh, you know, the particular environment of uh, freedom of speech in the United States. Uh, offensive from time to time, or actually on the internet generally where people often don't feel particularly localized to a jurisdiction. Uh, I think it's no surprise to, uh, to anyone here that people occasionally feel the impulse to say rude things to one another on the internet. Um, I think that uh, articulating the freedom of expression principles in a strong way at the outset of these debates in the 20th century has led to uh, very uh, progressive interpretations of the international human rights instruments and of particular national uh, human rights instruments as well uh, that really do embody a great degree of uh, tolerance for, uh, at least to some degree, for offensive and troubling speech. And if you think about why governments uh, have historically reserved to themselves the right to censor speech, it's one more sentence. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's because uh, they want to censor disturbing and troubling speech because nobody ever tries to censor the other kind. So I just wanted to put that out there and I think that actually the human rights instruments that we're working on here and the international uh, freedom of expression uh, guarantees are, uh, and the First Amendment are all part of a, of a very modern and progressive tradition that I think uh, 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 I, I'm proud to be a part of and I hope we continue to advance here. Okay, that links, I think, we'll get um, last speaker. Of course, the issue about hate speech and the difference between is rudeness a crime? Uh, do we prosecute somebody for being rude? But there's a slide into hate speech, uh, which also is an issue that perhaps as a case study, Uncle Alan Roberts' ideas is something that needs investigating according to specific sections of the Charter to help it highlight just these debates, which would be in themselves for me interesting as an academic, and they make them relevant for policy makers eventually. So these discussions need to happen. Um, thank you, Mike, that was really important, and the point is well taken. So, last comment, because we're at quarter, 10 past 10 and we need more coffee, and we have about five, 10 minutes of things to sort out, okay? Thanks. Um, just to pick up on the point that I think you're making, I think that there is rude, there's rude comments, there's offensive comments, and, there, and then there's threats. There are threats to violence. Someone saying, I hate you, who do you think you are, is not the same thing as saying, I know where you live, and I'm coming to kill you. Or, in the instance of our work, I know where you live, I want you to be quiet, and I'm coming to rape you. That's a very different conversation. And I think often what happens is, when we raise these issues, the anxiety is that we're calling for censorship. Is it censorship when you say to someone, actually, that's not okay? Yeah, I think it's about the framing of the conversation that sometimes causes a kind of, um, yeah, it causes an anxiety that what we're saying is regulate, what we're saying is criminalize, when that's not necessarily, I think, a productive entry point. But rather what's necessary is to flesh out how, why is this happening and are there different kinds of responses which are not about censorship because I don't think the entry point is 
to censor. Okay, final. So, just final. If we complete that, but I think yes. A more constructive way is to approach this. Just did you have a? Okay. We need that we need the microphone because there are people transcribing. So, if you just wait a moment. Remember, there's a whole world out there that's going to wake up tomorrow morning and going to rush to their computers to read this transcript. <laughs> so, have set their alarm clocks to do so. <laughs> so, final point on this topic. I'm sorry to have to be brutal, but yes. Go. No, I was just saying that the hate speech paper was written by Anya, and it's not public yet. And that ex that sorry. examines all this in detail. Okay. When will it be public? Mm, I don't, you can ask. Okay. Her. Okay, thank you very much. That's very, very useful, everyone. I'm just going to move to some um, quick points, and obviously because they have to be continued on our list. If you want to sign up to the coalition list, it is um, Tapani. What's it again? IRP at internetrightsandprinciples.org, and you can sign up. Um, please don't put any emails from me in the spam box. It's not the intention. Um, these lists have a habit of coming in waves. Um, so, I'm going to move quickly from May to some business uh, and we'll complete the business online. Just let me move my computer. For those who are new to the IRP coalition, we are a, a dynamic coalition, very much a do-it-yourself. And I mean do-it-yourself in the strong, positive sense of the term, not do-it-yourself as a the sad, we have no money sense of the term. Um, uh, just to recall those who have not yet heard that we managed to raise nearly 11, 1200 American dollars to finance the booklet and so we're looking for the last few dollars. If you have American dollars on you, press it into my hot footy palm please. I have 60 American dollars with me in various currencies. I will then make one credit card payment on my own credit card on behalf of you all. Um, because some people don't want to use a credit card. Five dollars, one dollar, I know, I don't know. I'm happy with anything. And then we'll be there. Um, I'm also very active in, yes? Take money from Bali. I'll take rupiah because I'll spend that. Right. Okay. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll, I'll spend rupiah. <laughs> Remember, remember, not only not too much, it's Thursday. Thursday I have lots of boutique to buy, but I will use my, my credit card to pay on your behalf. So thank you. Um, so come up afterwards. So very quickly, um, the IRP coalition also works with other dynamic coalitions, as Stuart Hamilton reminded us, and so we work profitably together. We're also an active member of the Best Books, which is a new, uh, very important network and space um, emerging from the IGF with, with um, a large set of plans that we hope to contribute to. So we're not like a little island here. And of course, we have some important um, civil society organizations as well and governmental um, membership from APC and Team for Change. Council of Europe has been involved and so on and so forth. So I just want to stress that. Um, we also have steering committee members also voluntarily. And I'm, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you to some people who are very important to note for the record. I'd like to say thank you and goodbye and good luck to Matthias Ketterman, who was my co-chair, who was Dixie Wilton's co-chair, and her previous um, uh, role as chair, co-chair. <laughs> so Matthias Ketterman is standing down, which means he enters the steering committee. Matthias is a, um, a legal expert based now in Frankfurt. So my apologies publicly to Matthias for attributing, attributing him incorrectly as German. He is in fact Austrian, and I have corrected that, and people don't understand why I must do this publicly, um, I've attributed it correctly on the new digital PDF, so this print version. So please correct now your print version. Um, these things happen. Um, most of us, people think I'm British, I'm not. Okay. Um, with all due respect to the British. Okay, Lee. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> okay, now that's, our, that's my former co-chair, which means the post is open. Steering committee members, I'd like to say goodbye and thank you very much to the following people who have, um, who have been helpful, very helpful this year and in previous years, actually. Some of these steering committees have been around a while and have been very instrumental in early versions. I'd like to thank Yanko Eisenman. I can get the names down um, for the record. Alan Barr, Norbert Bello, Mike Durstein, Shola Mystery. I'd like to thank them very much, Shola particularly who was there in the early days. 
But this stuff requires you to answer emails <laughs> and do lots of things that some of them are not possible. And they have done great service. Thank you very much. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. Well, there's my accent written up there for you all to see. Oh, my goodness me. Okay. I would now like just to note that our, our current steering committee stands at six members. Uh, Tapuni Tavirin. Tapuni, please make yourself... Who also runs our IRP list serve from um, Electronic Foundation Finland. Thank you, Tapuni, who's carrying on. Paminda Singh, who I know is also to give his apologies. IT for Change in India. Vic Zabados. I mean, Hungary, he's, he was extremely helpful for us. He's new and young. <laughs> young people, please step forward. <laughs> uh, Dixie Walton, I believe, is still okay. Please tell me if I'm wrong, people. There is no obligation because I'm meaning you. Matthias Ketanon, who's indicated, of course, he's as former co chair he's in the And, of course, Robert Bowden, who you've all met. So that's the current steering committee membership of six people plus me. Now, the question is, is six people are sufficient? Do we need more? Um, if we need more, then we did, we, I propose we do what we did last year, self-nominate and go through an election endorsement process on them. But the question is in this room, do we need more than six people on the steering committee? Is that enough? I mean, I'm not saying this decision should be made here definitively, but Dixie, do you have any inputs? I think just for a couple of minutes, I think it's important to consider this, because steering committees um, are just simply there to help knock ideas around with, <coughs> provide suggestions, put up with emails from the chair, uh, the chair is poor, Dixie and then Olivier, yeah? I don't think we necessarily need more people, because six is quite a good number, but I think we probably do want new people, because if everyone that's on the steering committee has been a, on the steering committee last year as well, then, you know, we can stagnate. It would be good to have new ideas and new people on there. Thanks, Dixie. It's my fault entirely. Especially this, um, I just want to say, just before Olivia comes in, we had a very successful outing at the Lisbon European Dialogue Internet Governance. We had a fabulous time, and that's building forward. Belgrade, I'm sort of going to be there for Council of Europe. Um, them. So the IP Coalition, um, through Victor particularly, is based in Hungary. Victor did fabulous work, um, really engaging with younger people and got a whole lot of new members. So I, I endorse Dixie's point. We don't, we could hang out with six, but I think we can be open um, to new members. But would I be able to say that younger members? I don't want to be ageist, but we are getting a bit middle-aged, with all due respect. Maybe it's just me. Um, if anybody wants to join the Senior Ladies Caucus, it was formally convened last night at the pool, by the way. You may join us. No, no previous experience required. Okay, but Dixie, so Olivia. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Olivia Kapan of uh, speaking. Um, I think the committee might wish to consider having some strategic uh, positions in the committee, so perhaps uh, uh, thinking of people that you might wish to invite from outside this room. Uh, from elsewhere that might be helpful for the committee. And then, of course, it, it really is down to, to you guys to find out how the workload is. And if you need a heck of a lot more people for all the work that happens, then by, no, you know, by all means, go it. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, you're having a great time, then uh, uh, and there's not very much work or anything like that, and I suspect that's not the case, um, no. then you might <laughs> want to shrink the committee and just end up with one. Okay. No, I'm just kidding on this one. Um, no, you're doing an excellent job, so thank you. Yeah. No, I think the point is taken. The steering committee is not a closed shop. I think let's open it up. Have we agreed? We open it up to the, to the list. Okay. And if anybody wants to, st wants to self nominate now for the steering committee, let us know. And this can be put to the list afterwards. Is there any other business? It's not any other business. It's just the, uh, um, the point before, which is to say that. Uh, Everyone, uh, as regards being on the steering committee, it's, it's always difficult to see what, to decide whether you have the time to do that extra work because you have lots of work. Um, that goes for me too. But I am committed to helping, oh, not okay. being on the steering committee. Yes, exactly. So I cannot. Yeah. So what I would, what I'm saying is that if I could be loosely associated to the, to the committee, if you can strategically just grab me for something, one thing. Occasionally, okay. where it's need, I, I can help, that, and, and that's being loosely associated. I think that's something which needs to be understood. I mean, I think there are plenty of people who can do that rather than be nominated, you know, appointed, and have their name everywhere. Oh, so. I think it's a very good idea. Thank you, Lee. 
So we could we're hoping that if anybody wants to sub nominate for the steering committee, which means committing to a certain amount of work and co thinking, and a loose group of people who yeah. can we can call on and off list emails to help out. But yeah. also self nominate and keep it kind of light. Define the title loosely association. Loose, loose association. <laughs> friends of the friends of the steering committee. Um there's a lovely phrase in, in the Netherlands where I work and live, have worked for many years and still live part time. Um, yeah, whatever. They say critical friends, critical friends. So critical friends of <laughs> or friendly critics. <laughs> okay, um, but loosely. So I think that's a great idea. Let's put that forward. Um, we still have a list of people. I think there's a second page walking around the room. Is there any other business? I have one other item I'd like to also because we have two copies left of the charter. I have more in my office, but two for now. Stampede about to begin. Uh, the guide um, poster for tomorrow's Council View at launch and some flyers of a very important book um, framing the net from Larkin Jorgensen, who is a member of the expert group of the Charter and the expert group of the Council View at Guide. And she's written, I would suggest, the definitive book on how human rights has been framed in a number of areas. So I'd like to plug this book on America's behalf. I think it's a, a very important reference point. So, um, without too much further ado, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming at this hour and lovely to have you. And see you around on the list or in person. Money to me. Money to me. And the final list of names and addresses to me as well. We'll try and transcribe all these. Thank you.